Good morning, and welcome to the Salvation Army Meadowlands Community Church. We're so glad you have chosen to worship with us on this third Sunday of Advent, the season of waiting. I bring you these words from Psalm 130. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. People, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you today for this opportunity we have once again to gather together as your people to worship you. We gather around computer screens, around phones. Some of us are gathered in our homes. But wherever we are today, we pray that we will sense your presence with us and that we will worship you in spirit and in truth and we'll be reminded once again of your great love for us. So be with us in our worship, the songs that we sing, the reading of your word, the message we hear from your word today through your servant. And we pray that as we bless you with our worship, that we will be blessed indeed, because we have taken this time to stop, to sit, and to listen to you speak to us as we worship you together. In Jesus Christ, we make this prayer. Amen. Amen. Let us worship the Lord together.
what does this say? Savior, Messiah, Lord. What does that mean? Jesus saved us from sin, the promised deliverer of the world, master, ruler. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Um, hello? Anyone here? Hi. Whoa, we're here before the leader. That's like getting to school before the teacher. Yeah, it really is. You guys realize she doesn't live on the Zoom chat, right? We have met her in person before. Uh, yeah. Because she lives in her classroom. Obviously. No, she doesn't. Teachers do have houses, and Zoom leaders have real houses. They don't just live in cyberspace. Oh, yeah. I knew that. Oh, here she comes. Hey, everyone. I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, my Wi-Fi was being weird. That's okay. At least it's not me this time. Well, now that we're all here, we can begin. Um, I have a question about last week's lesson. Yeah, go for it, Jenna. So, does the Bible ever mention what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego after the furnace? Well, actually, no. They are never really mentioned by name, but it is assumed, like Daniel, that they lived as members in the king's court. Wait a second. Daniel? Wasn't he the guy who was thrown into the lion's den? He was, and he could also interpret dreams like Joseph could. Oh, is that what we're learning about this week? No, it's not, Daniel. Today we're going to be taking a step back, back in time, before the fiery furnace, even before Jeremiah. Time travel? Does anyone have a TARDIS? Uh, what? No. Who? Doctor Who. <laughs> no, we're not dealing with time travel. Just back a few books. Julia, I didn't know you were a Doctor Who fan. Oh yeah, I really love the show. <laughs> alright, alright, let's get back on track. I'm glad you mentioned love, Julia, because th that's this week's theme. Today we're going to be learning about a man named Isaiah. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah. Why do all prophets have similar sounding names? Is it like some kind of biblical prerequisite? Makes it easier to remember though. So today's story begins quite a few years before the fall of Jerusalem. Israel hadn't been conquered yet, Babylon hadn't conquered Assyria yet, and there were still kings and prophets in the land. At this time, the kings of Judah were starting to slip up into bad habits, just like their counterparts in Israel had long been doing. Isaiah's job was to warn them against it. Like Jeremiah, he wrote a lot about enemies coming to conquer God's people if they didn't listen. I'm starting to lose count how many times I've had to tell the king that the Assyrians are going to conquer us if we don't listen up. But does he listen to me? No, no he's not going to listen to me. You know, I'm really starting to see a pattern in the Bible. The Israelites mess up, and then God sends a prophet to warn them. They still don't listen, so bad things happen. But when they listen, good things happen. Then it just repeats. Very good, Jenna. That is the pattern in the history of God's people. That has happened from the time of Moses right up till the time Jesus came. An endless cycle. Wow. God must have a lot of patience. Indeed he does, but more on that later. Now, what was so special about Isaiah is aside from his messages of doom and gloom, 
He prophesies a lot about the coming of Jesus. Hmm, let me think. People walking in darkness have seen a great torch? Star? Nah, that doesn't sound quite right. Um, torch, star, what do those things give off? Uh, light. Light. It's walking in darkness have seen a great light. Yeah, it's fitting for the, for the light of the world. Light, yeah. But wait. If Isaiah was before Jeremiah, then who told him about Jesus? God told Isaiah to write it all down, just like he would later tell Jeremiah in order to give the people of Judah hope. Um, wasn't hope already covered? I thought this week we're, we were talking about love. Whoa, slow down! Now I'm getting really confused! In this case, it's all connected, which is why I wanted to cover this story after doing Jeremiah. Hope exists from love. Without love, there would not be any hope. And that's why God loves us so much, to send us hope in the form of his son. Oh. But if God loved his people so much, then... Why did he have them go into exile in the first place? Wow, really good questions this week. I will answer them in just a moment, okay? Okay. Later in Isaiah's life, the kingdom of Judah was threatened by the invasion of the Assyrians. Those were the ones that defeated the Israelites and were later, later beaten by Babylon, right? Yeah, that's correct. Ugh, feels like keeping track of sports teams. Listing which nation defeated each other. Anyways, the leader of Judah at the time was King Hezekiah. He was one of the kings that followed God's laws and tried to keep the kingdom doing likewise. We've received this from our scouts, sir. Zutelor! The Assyrians are moving north to the kingdom as we speak. By this time tomorrow, we will be the only city left on Tekken. What are your orders, sir? Order the entire army to come to this place and regroup for a last stand. We have the best advantage here. But most importantly, I want every single man, woman, and child in this jackanap of an army to be praying to God constantly as hard as they can. A new you, we pass on. I want you to go to Isaiah and ask him if there is any advice he has for us. So Hezekiah sent his messenger to Isaiah and asked him what God had told him. Isaiah! Whew. Whew. Stairs. I, co mm. I come from King Hezekiah. The Assyrians, they're coming to conquer us, and we're not sure what to do. So, he bids me to ask you if God is on our side for this, and what we should do. Tell your master this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you have heard. I will be with you against the Assyrians. Tell Hezekiah that, and that he will be with you. When the messenger returned to Hezekiah with the good news, he was overjoyed. God was protecting his people. But that doesn't make sense. Why would God protect his people here and not later on with Jeremiah? Because it was all part of his plan. God doesn't want his people to suffer, but through every bit of suffering, he makes something good come from it. From the exile of the Israelites would eventually come Jesus, the ultimate expression of God's love for us. So wait, God was planning all of this from the beginning? Ever since the Garden of Eden? Yeah, all of it was part of his eventual plan for all of us.
Whoa. Whoa. I never realized the Bible was so intricate. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Oh, um, sorry everyone, but because of me being late, we're almost out of time for this week. But um, does anybody have any questions before we go? So God told Isaiah, Jeremiah, and who knows who else that Jesus was coming. And when he came, the Pharisees were still upset. Why is that? Oh, Julia, that's a really good question. Um, I hope that by the end of next week's lesson, we may be able to answer that, okay? Okay. All right. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye, guys. Today, we light the candle of love on our Advent wreath. And we are reminded of God's great love for us when he sent Jesus into the world, born as a babe in a manger, but later to die on a cross for our sins. That is his demonstration of his great love for us. And it is our prayer that we would demonstrate God's love in the way we live our lives and we share Christ's love with everybody we come in contact with throughout the week, throughout the Christmas season, and throughout 2021. God bless you. Morning, everybody. Um, today's scripture we found in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, and was now expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the field nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in, cloth, in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. May God bless this word this morning. Hi. It's that time in our service again when we worship in a different way. We worship by coming together and singing praises to God. We worship by coming together and listening to his word. But we also worship God by our gifts and our offering, just as the wise men brought their gifts to Christ as an act of worship. So we invite you to go to the uh, YouTube uh, link in the video description, or for those of you who are with us on the Zoom, uh, you will see the address appear in the chat. Let's share a quick prayer together. Father, we say thank you for your many gifts to us. We thank you for the offering of Christ to us as our salvation. And we thank you too for the opportunity to give back to you a portion of the many good gifts that you have given to us through Christ our Lord.
Good morning. Great to be with you this morning and welcome to everyone who's joined us. We're going to continue our series on uh, Jesus Unwrapped, What Lies Within the Babe Who Lies Within the Manger. And I want to say thank you to Colton and Lorelei for showing us the three, uh, three points that we're going to be considering this morning. Jesus as our Savior, our Messiah, and our Lord. But I want to begin this morning with something that's completely unrelated to Christmas, and that is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. In, in this particular theory, Maslow identifies the basic needs that we uh, all have requirement for in order to fulfill our lives as human beings. He talks about the physiological needs, our need for uh, food and water and warmth. He talks about the safety needs that we have, mostly in the, with respect to shelter. He talks about our need for a sense of belonging and being loved. He talks about our need for esteem, a sense of feeling accomplishment at things we do. And the pinnacle of Maslow's hierarchy is self-actualization, where someone fulfills their, their full potential, including the sense of their creative activities and being able to thrive in the world. I'm no psychologist, but I propose that Maslow misses a key component in our existence as humans who are made in the image of God. I think he draws really close with that concept of self-actualization, but he's missing out on a human's spiritual needs. Created in the image of God, there is a need in all humanity that we strive toward. Even those who have reached the pinnacle of self-actualization often share that there is still something missing in their lives. And today, Colton and Laura Lee unwrapped another facet of Jesus. The babe in the manger also contains Savior, Messiah, and Lord. I want us to pause for a few moments to consider these words. They tend to be churchy words that we've accepted into our vocabulary within the church and we sometimes may miss out on a deepening appreciation for these terms. And I'm going to propose that today we consider these words and connect them to the higher need that we have as human beings. And I also want to connect these candles to, or connect these, me, uh, <clears throat> these needs to the Advent candle that we've been looking at. First, we'll look at Jesus as our Savior and I want us to reflect on the candle of faith. All of us strive for some sense of self-sufficiency. I can do it. I can do it on my own. I don't need any help. We're able to do it with our own power and our own determination. I'm mindful of a story that happened to us at training college. When our third daughter, Talitha, was born at training college, Sandra was determined. She was going to make sure that she was not going to miss any classes. She was going to carry on her duties as always. And she was going to make sure that under her own power, things would be accomplished. And one day, one of our fellow cadets came and said to Sandra, can I offer to do your laundry for you today? I'm going down to do mine. And Sandra's immediate response was, no, 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 no. I can, I can do that myself. But on further reflection, we thought, hmm, here's an opportunity for someone to perform a service for us. And yet we ended up saying, no, thank you. When probably a more appropriate response would have been to allow this person to do our laundry and give them a sense of performing a service for Christ. Just a small example, right? But when we deny someone's offer of help to us, we deny them that opportunity to carry out a ministry in the name of Jesus. We have need, we all have need of saving, saving to keep us from going to a point of exhaustion in our lives. And God provides that. 
He provides it through Jesus, our Savior, ultimately, but he also provides salvation and saving from ourselves through other people as well. I want to share another story. When, when we were uh, in Papua New Guinea, we were traveling to one of our uh, exhibition, expeditions, and one of our cadets, uh, his name was Billy, was on the top of all the cargo that was packed in the Hilux. So if you can imagine the back of the Hilux or the, the pickup truck, it was just piled so high. And Billy was sitting on top of all this cargo with a few other cadets, and we had to go down into a stream and come up the other side. I was driving. So as we went down into the stream, I increased the acceleration and we kind of shot up the, uh, the other side of the stream. And as we began to go up, Billy began to fall and he cried out, save me. And he ended up, some of the other cadets, of course, reached down and kept him from falling. But he ended up with the nickname of Save Me Billy, Billy throughout uh, college life. The point I'm trying to make is that we work so hard at making sure that we are taking care of ourselves. And often we only call out, save me, when we find that our dependence on ourselves is no longer working. Our own skills, our own talents, our own abilities are no longer effective to care for us. We are failing at caring for ourselves and we cry out, save me. Then, and only then, after we've called out, save me, we place our lives in the hands of someone else because we acknowledge the inability to save ourselves. So Jesus as Savior, one who saves us from dependence on our imperfect self in order to develop a deepening relationship with God, and a willingness on our part to give that responsibility of deepening the relationship God with God to Jesus. He became our Savior, and primarily He saves us from ourselves. He saves us from the self-delusion that we can make it through life on our own, and that we need no help. We all need a Savior. We all need that candle of faith to believe that when we call on the name of the Lord, we will be saved. An unwrapped Jesus as Savior shows us the faith that is possible and that is available through relationship with him. Not only do we as people need a Savior, but we also need a Messiah, a symbol of hope. I remember as a young boy, Christmas uh, morning was so exciting, and one of the saddest days of the year for me at that time was Boxing Day. On December 26th, I realized that there, there would be a long period of time, such a long period of time before Christmas would come again. And yet that was also mingled with a sliver of hope. The countdown to next Christmas had already begun. And this small flicker of hope that was dwelling in me, that would grow and grow as the year unfolded and as we got closer and closer to Christmas again. Messiah, someone who is anointed, set apart by God to bring justice, to bring peace, to bring the things that we so much miss and need in our lives. Connected with Messiah is this expectation that there is a coming and we have a longing of something or someone that's going to be great enough to be able to remove our life problems and issues. Messiah, set apart, anointed for a God-given task. Messiah, who can, in the midst of our bondage and pain, in the midst of our suffering, bring us hope and a belief that something good is on the way, something better is coming. This COVID pandemic that we're experiencing gives us a little glimpse into this. We have expectation and a hope that something good is coming, 
It's on the horizon. Hardships have been imposed upon us. Restrictions have been applied. Confinement and lockdown uh, have become commonly used words. And yet, yet, there is hope. There is hope for a vaccine that will be distributed in time. There is a hope that this pandemic will end and end soon. There is a hope that we will get a more normal living back. So no matter life situation, be it a pandemic for the world or be it your own personal issue that you're struggling with, this promise of hope is essential for us to live our lives with a sense of peace, with a sense of hope that there will indeed be something better coming. When, when we lose a loved one, we tend to rely on the hope provided that in the intensity of this grief, there will be peace. There is a hope of reuniting once again with our loved one. There is the hope that Messiah will arrive at some point and be the deliverer for us from this uncertainty in life. The concept of Messiah holds the candle of hope high. All is not lost. The darkness is indeed dispelled by the light. And scripture reminds us that morning lasts for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The hopes we experience in life are but flickers of the great hope that we have in Christ our Messiah and the hope he brings in his coming, not in some future event, but also his hopes of his coming into our lives in the now, the hope of his deliverance from the darkness that threatens to consume us now. Darkness exists all around us, and I don't need to share that with you. The suicides, the homicides, the poverty-stricken, the disease-ridden, the pains and the sufferings experienced by all humanity threatens to snuff out our hope. It tempts us to just throw up our hands in despair and say everything is hopeless. But, as believers in Christ, but we remember that Jesus is on the horizon. Hold on. Keep the faith. Embrace hope because all is not lost. Things are not hopeless. One day, one day, all will be redeemed. And unwrap Jesus as Messiah shows us the hope that is available through relationship with him. So we ask the question again, what lies within the babe that lies within the manger? Well, it's multifaceted. We learn so far in our series that Jesus is our redeemer. He is our shepherd. We've considered how he is our savior and our Messiah. And I want to reflect for a few moments on how Jesus is also our Lord. That word Lord, like many other words from Scripture, has become a churchy word. Originally, the meaning of Lord was someone who is in authority, someone who has power and control with the ability to punish those who may step out of bounds. In first century Christendom, the phrase used was Caesar is Lord. He's the one with the power. He's the one with the authority. He's the one who controls our lives. And early first century Christians who had come to believe and accept Jesus as their savior, as their Messiah, as their redeemer, as their shepherd, they coined the phrase Jesus is Lord, which was in direct opposition to what was the common greeting of the day. Because they shifted their allegiance and acknowledgement from Caesar as Lord to Jesus as Lord. Jesus is the one who has the authority, and the power, and the power to not only enforce regulations and laws, 
but also the power of forgiveness. In the 16th century, a title, the Lord Protector, was given to someone who would oversee the running of a country if the king was too young to assume the throne and the responsibilities. Lord Protector was a term that was given to Oliver Cromwell in 1653 to 58, when Cromwell wielded parliamentary power exclusively. And the idea behind that, even though it may not have actualized in reality, but the idea behind Lord is one who protects, one who cares for, one who sustains, one who keeps life free from war and turmoil and fears. In short, a Lord was to bring peace. The Pax Romanus at the time in the first century was a term given during the Roman Empire to acknowledge there was a level of peace throughout the expanse of Roman Empire. People could travel great distances with a, with a sense of security that they would not be attacked or robbed. So we have this sense of being at peace with Jesus the peace ultimately Jesus brings to our lives as our Lord. With Jesus as Lord, we can walk through our life journey confidently that no matter what, and I'll say that again, no matter what, we can still experience Jesus as Lord, as the Prince of Peace throughout our day-to-day -day living. Hardships, losses, uncertainty, that's going to happen to all of us who live. But for those of us who call Jesus Lord, we can walk through life confidently that no matter what, we can have this peace. Jesus, after all, is the Prince of Peace. He promises a peace that passes our understanding. An unwrapped Jesus as Lord shows us the peace that is available through relationship with him. Savior gives us salvation, so we walk through life by faith. Messiah gives us the ability to walk through this world with hope. And Lord, Jesus as Lord, enables us to walk through life not with worries, but with peace. My friends, I can't know what burdens you may have at this time in your life, but I do invite you to think about faith, Hope and peace. Think about Jesus as Savior, Messiah, and Lord. And know that these attributes are available to us. Not because of our works or anything that we have done, but simply because of God's generosity. Because of God's gift to the world. So at this time in your life, whether you are seeking faith, hope or peace. I want to assure you that these can be found by connecting with Jesus. And if you'd like to connect with Jesus, I invite you to connect with us here at Meadowlands and we will be more than pleased to talk to you more about what it means to connect with Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, your generosity and your gifts to us so manifested in the babe in the manger. And we thank you that as we pause from week to week and consider the significance of Jesus and what he brings to us, that we are just so thankful for that gift. Lord, our lives, our lives meet with turmoil, frustration, sadness, uncertainty. But as we keep coming back to you, we can find that sense of peace, and security, that sense of hope, that sense of faith, oh God, that keeps us connected to you through Jesus our Lord. And in it's in his name we make this prayer this day. Amen. Have a great week.
This time we come before God, we acknowledge to him our shortcomings, our fears, our concerns, and the needs of each of our hearts. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you who have given so much to the world, we thank you that we have been able to become partakers of your many gifts. Lord, today we wish to acknowledge the pains, the fears, the grief that we are experiencing. Some have lost a loved one. Others have lost employment. Some have been forced to go to food banks, seek shelter, for many and various reasons. Some have been incarcerated, and we acknowledge, O oh God, Jesus' instruction to us to feed, care, visit those who are lonely and often forgotten in our society. So Lord, at this Christmas time, when we reflect on your many gifts to the world through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray that you would make us sensitive to and open to taking action, O oh God, in the way that Jesus prescribed to us. And now we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, and we ask you, O oh God, to minister to each of our hearts as we recite these words together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us here at Netherlands, and we hope you will join us next week as we continue with our Christmas Unwrapped series. Just a reminder that we will be having a very special December the 24th Christmas Eve virtual candlelight celebration of the birth of Christ at 6 p.m. And now our benediction. As we go from this place in time, may we carry with us Jesus, our Redeemer, Jesus, our Shepherd, Jesus, our Savior, our Messiah, and Lord, into our thinking, into our living, and into our world. Amen.